Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our BU Bushfire Response Program for today, Understanding Transitions in the Context of Disaster Recovery and Resilience. My name is Ben Rogers, and I'm the Manager of Families and Education at Emerging Minds. If you haven't attended a session like this before, you'll notice that you won't be able to use your mic, webcam, or chat box, and that you're in listen-only mode. This is just due to the large number of attendees who are here today but you can ask any questions or write any comments in the Q&A box and we have some of our wonderful colleagues online to answer those today. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend our respect to all elders and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. Um, I personally am meeting on the lands of the Ghana people today of the Adelaide Plains. And I'd also like to acknowledge that our presenters are meeting on the contested lands of the Nadago and Bidawell people, the Ngunnawal lands and the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So remember that your own wellbeing is a priority. So as we discuss the content today, and if anything that arises that um, has any impact on your wellbeing, please refer to the wellbeing tools for educators, which is available on the BU website along with your employee assistance program provider. And please do take care of yourself today and, and take as many breaks as you need. Um, and I think it's really important that before we start that you take a moment to think about when we're talking about mental health in any context, including trauma, it can affect us all in different ways. So you'll all come with your own unique experiences. So if there's absolutely anything that we cover today that raises any uncomfortable feelings, please feel free to opt out or take a break um, and reach out to your own support network. We've collated a few um, key information on the screen for you to, to reference if you need to connect with a service as well. Um, a reminder that today's session is recorded so that you're able to watch it at a later date. So really excited to welcome you all here today to this webinar, um, which is presented by BU, the Bushfire Response Program and hosted by Emerging Minds. And this webinar is actually a series of two. And um, we have this webinar today and we'll have a follow-up webinar in March next year. And we're focusing in on supporting the knowledge and understanding of disaster recovery and resilience. Uh, today's focus, as you, you know, is on transition. So a really important uh, topic as we think about the context that you as educators are working in. And as you can see, we've got three um, really interesting learning objectives that we're going to explore today. We'll start off by looking at the research related to transitions, uh, and then we'll unpack your role as an educator in supporting transitions. And in blended throughout today's presentation is really practical things that you can use um, in your early learning service or school to support the children and young people in your setting. So before we meet our presenters today, I wanted to just give a little bit of information about the BU Bushfire Response Program. So as you can see through this visual on your screen, uh, the program was funded by the Department of Health and the program provides support to early learning services that were impacted um, and schools impacted by the 1920, 2020-2020 uh, bushfires. And since that time, BU has supported more than 480 uh, learning communities following the impact of the Black Summer fires. And we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that many of you are here today. So a big hello to everyone that's joining us from those schools and early learning services. As you can see, the program model now has been shaped to really acknowledge the context of what it's like for learning communities 18 months on to two years following the, the fires and to acknowledge the cumulative impact. We know that COVID and floods, drought and other experiences of community trauma have impacted learning communities across the country. So this program is led by Beyond Blue and delivered in partnership with Early Childhood Australia and Headspace. And the program continues to offer support to learning communities as they transition uh, to support offered through a BU consultant. So this will involve professional learning and resources which are part of the BU initiative. So. That's enough of me talking for today. I wanted, wanted to introduce our wonderful presenters uh, to the webinar, Dr. Catherine Hopps, Billy Newton, and Brad Bannister. Welcome, everyone. 
So before we get into the presentations today, um, what I wanted to do is invite each of the presenters to, to share a little bit about what's captured their interest in today's topics. And, you know, I know that this is a really important topic for a lot of our presenters. And we might start with you, Catherine. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ben. And um, so what got me into transitions? Well, I've been working in the education sector for over 20 years now in various roles, but I originally trained as an early child and primary teacher, covering education from birth to age 12. And because of this, I worked in a diverse range of education settings, including early learning, school age care and primary schools as well. So essentially transitions have always been part of my roles as an educator. And in my work supporting children and families, I drew very much upon the research of Sue Dockett and Bob Perry from the original starting school research study in Australia. And I eventually stepped away from teaching to pursue a PhD focusing on transition to school, particularly communication between educators. And since then, I've been involved in a number of local and national transition to school studies, as well as my own doctoral studies. So I've talked to lots of children, families and educators all around the place about transitions. And I've learned a lot about fantastic transition practices that are happening. And now in my current role as a BE consultant for Early Child Australia, I'm interested in mentally healthy transitions. And I continue a research interest as an adjunct at CSU, particularly an interest in transitions during the pandemic. So that's me. Thank you, Catherine. And, and Billy, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience in supporting educators and learning communities in this area? Sure, thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been working as an occupational therapist for the past eight years with children, families and educators in a range of school and community settings. Um, my current role is for Royal Far West and I'm working on the Bushfire Recovery Program, which involves supporting children, families, schools and preschools in New South Wales who are impacted by the 1920 bushfires. Um, this involves working closely with learning communities to identify their recovery needs and then putting together a program of services to meet their needs. Um, and some of the things we do are group programs for children, uh, workshops and consultations with carers and educators and individualised therapy for kids as well. Um, I'm really passionate about helping children recover from community trauma through play, connection, finding their voice and having agency in their recovery. And I've seen how children are finding transitions increasingly difficult following the accumulation of um, experiences and events um, that Ben's already mentioned. And um, I've also seen how essential it is to collaborate with the adults around the child to support their recovery. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. And Brad, you're the principal of a school that was impacted by the fires. Why is this topic of transitions really important to you? Yeah, thanks, Ben, and thanks, ladies. Um, firstly, I'm a passionate advocate for public education, as well as supporting young people who may be struggling with anxiety or mental health issues. Our school and its community are already vice, uh, very isolated. We're down in the foothills of the Snowy Mountains and nestled right on the border of Victoria and New South Wales, and we were basically... Um, horseshoed by the fires for a four month period and that meant that there was only one way in one way out and we found that every time we came back to town or you sort of mumbled to yourself oh the town's still there which was really nice uh, uh not really nice at that particular time um, and being part of a small community um, i needed to be able to put my skill set to the best use to support not only the students in our transition back to school after the holidays but also my staff and the wider community, because most of my staff lived here in town or lived on the properties out of town and the wider community as well and how we could best support them. We are a very small community, very small school and a very small community. Um, and as such, we had the opportunity to ensure that we were just the glue that helped, that basically helped hold the town together during that time of crisis. Um, my previous school as, that I was principal at where we had a large percentage of uh, the school population were from refugee backgrounds. And so working with those children and families gave me a skill set and experience to support my current school. So working with all families in transitions to school in a wide variety of contexts has been close to my heart for a long period of time. Thanks, Brad. Um, and really wanted to um, invite the participants today to give me a, give a big, warm, uh, virtual welcome to our presenters. And yeah, just hearing each of your backgrounds, I'm really excited to, to hear 
your presentations today and we'll have time at the end for, for questions from the audience as well. So we're gonna get things started today by hearing from Catherine who will be exploring some of the key research in this area. And she'll also touch on the role of educators in supporting children with transitions. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks, Ben. Um, so look, I thought I'd begin today um, talking about what, what are transitions? So if we consider Yuri Bromfenbrenner's bioecological theory, transitions are movements between and within settings. And they're about people, processes, context and time. And time is a really key one in distinguishing transitions from sudden or one-off events. So transitions don't begin and end, for example, on a child's first day at school. They extend over many weeks, months, and sometimes years. From research on educational transitions, we know that transitions are a key time to support wellbeing. They're also a time that brings both opportunities and challenges, and transitions involve both continuity and change. So drawing on several decades of research about transitions, it's gonna go through a few key considerations that I think are really important. And these can be applied to a range of transitions that children and young people experience, such as starting in an education setting for the first time, it might be returning after a long absence, or it could even be some daily transitions that those, like those that happen between, for example, home and school or home and early learning service. So the key uh, considerations that I'm going to talk about today are well-being and safety, relationships and belonging, family engagement, active participation of children and young people, and a nurturing environment. So the first one I wanted to talk about is well-being and safety. So it's absolutely fundamental that during times of transition, children, young people and their families feel that they're safe in their education setting. And this includes both physical and emotional safety. Research has highlighted for families who have history which include trauma, that there may be increased anxiety about leaving their child or young person in an unfamiliar place with unfamiliar people. For example, as transition researchers, we really advocate that it's essential that children and their families know who's looking after them and keeping them safe. And whilst there are some challenges, in the current pandemic context with familiarisation activities, and make, even just making plans and things that involve coming into education settings, there are still many things that we can do to build that sense of safety by connecting people. Transitions are also opportunities to build children's, families, educators and communities resilience. The next key consideration is around relationships and belonging key to all transitions across all contexts are relationships. Relationships between and among children and young people, their educators and families. Transitions are actually really good opportunities to build and maintain and maybe even repair relationships. Protective relationships for children can buffer against the risks and the stresses and the challenges of transitions including transitions in the context of disaster recovery. One measure of a successful transition is when a child and their family experiences a sense of belonging to the education setting. And we know that belonging is crucial for mental health of children and young people. So this is a key consideration for times of transition. The next consideration is family engagement. Families are entitled to feel confident that their children's wellbeing will be supported at school. Confident families will reflect positively on children's experiences of transitions too. So when we seek partnerships with families, where there are many opportunities for two-way communication and the building of trust right from the get-go, this supports transitions. And for families to know the ways that your learning community supports their child or young person's wellbeing, as well as their learning. If we think about specifically disaster recovery, research on the transition experiences of families with complex support needs has highlighted that transitions are actually a time where many families seek and are receptive to support. So transitions are a key opportunity to support families and children. 
Our next key consideration is around the active participation of children and young people. Transitions are really best seen, not as something that just happens to children, but, some, but there's a time in which they actively participate. They influence and are influenced by their transition experiences. Seeking children and young people's views and responding to these is important, such as asking questions and wonderings, asking about children's concerns, asking children for their advice, and also their hopes and aspirations. And it's important to understand that even very young children can actively contribute to transitions. Say, for example, a young child choosing a transition object or toy from home to bring to the education setting and provide that connection between their home and learning community. My last key consideration is around nurturing environments. So nurturing environments incorporate all of the, the four considerations that we've already covered. And nurturing environments are always important, but even more so with transitions in the context of disaster recovery. For example, for young children, right from birth through the early years of primary school, nurturing environments include opportunities for play, for rest and relaxation, for security in routines and rituals, having emotionally available and supportive educators, and continuity of staffing. And for all children and young people, nurturing environments can be described as those that attend to their social emotional well-being, as well as their learning. And now going to um, hand over to Billy. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so today I'll shed some light on what transitions can feel like for children and why they can sometimes be really challenging. So as you can see from the photos, my job involves coming up with fun and creative ways to support kids, build on their strengths and help them with everyday challenges. Um, and today I'll just I'll discuss the strategies that I use and recommend to support transitions. So can, transitions can happen over the course of months, like moving from preschool to primary school, over a few minutes, like from playground to classroom, or a few seconds from one activity to another. And all of these examples cause us to move from one state of expectations to another, which causes a level of stress. Our ability to cope with this stress is dependent on our regulation. And this is where it is helpful to understand the window of tolerance. So when a person is within their window, they are regulated. They feel safe, they are calm, but energized and are able to deal with whatever's happening in their life. They might feel some level of stress, but they can cope with it. Within their window, a person can learn and engage from others. And this is the green section that you can see on the screen. Stress can cause a person to move outside their window into a hyper arousal state, meaning higher energy, feelings of anxiety, anger, overwhelm, or feeling out of control, or a hypo arousal state, meaning lower energy, zoned out, feelings of sadness or loss of motivation. A person who is resilient thanks to a strong support system will move back into their window after experiences of stress and will spend most of their day there. What we see in children and adults following experiences of high stress or trauma is a narrowing of their window. They have less capacity to remain in their window and are more likely to move outside of their window from stress, no matter how minor the stress it may seem. So some key things to consider in terms of transitions are, recognizing that a child may experience the transition as a stressor and move outside of their window, meaning the transition has overwhelmed their ability to cope and you may see a reaction that appears more intense than expected for the transition. This understanding allows us to approach the child with greater acceptance and empathy and adjust our expectations. Additionally, acknowledging that as an adult, if you are outside your window, it will be very difficult to support a child that is also outside their window. This is why looking after yourself and your well-being is so important. We all want our kids to be able to self-regulate, but what we don't often appreciate is that self-regulation is a high-level skill that can only be achieved if we have had adequate co-regulation. Co-regulation happens when an adult uses their safe, predictable presence to calm a child. In times of stress, we look to someone we know and trust to know if we are safe. And this is the premise of co-regulation. For example, if the fire alarm goes off at school, the children will look to the teacher for guidance. They will notice her body language and facial expression. And before she even speaks, 
these cues will calm or alert their nervous systems. Just as a mother does to calm her baby, adults can use their tone of voice and facial expression to send cues to a child in distress that they are safe. Since transitions can be stressful, these will be your best tools for keeping things calm. Generally, using a conversational tone of voice, moving more slowly, not positioning yourself too close to the child and showing your concern and empathy in your facial expression and body language will communicate safety. As Catherine highlighted, having strong relationships with each of the children you work with will support co-regulation during transitions. Children's relationships with each other and their parents or carers also support their regulation in a similar way. A few ideas for school include, educators can greet each child as they enter the classroom and build co-regulation into the start of the school day. The two by 10 strategy involves an educator spending two minutes each day for 10 days with a student in need, not for learning, but to be with them, listen to them and get to know their interests. This builds safety and trust and lets the child know that they are valued. You can also foster peer relationships through structured play, buddy systems, and allowing siblings to be together during playtimes if possible. Preparation is a key step in supporting transitions and a great opportunity to involve the child. Answer these questions together. What will it look like? Who will be there? What is expected of me? What are my concerns and how might it feel? Make it child friendly by exploring these questions through pretend play, drawing, role play, videos, books, conversations, whatever is appropriate for the child's developmental level and interests. A key part of this is exploring and validating their feelings. It might feel scary and make them feel nervous. It might also be exciting and fun. It might be confusing having these competing emotions at the same time. Communicate that all of these feelings are okay and normal. Before I start therapy with a child, I send them a personalized letter with photos and a video of what to expect. We use visuals as much as possible, as we know that when a child is stressed, the part of their brain responsible for language processing is harder to access, but the visual system of the brain is online and can process an image. After you have explored concerns and feelings, make a plan to support the child at the time of the transition. Again, this is an opportunity to draw on the strengths and interests of the child, along with other things we know are regulating, such as relationships, sensory input, routines and visuals. For example, a child who is having difficulty getting to school in the morning may benefit from bringing a toy or a photo album from home. You might agree they can call a parent for a couple of minutes at recess. You might build in a movement break or use a weighted toy for sensory input they may have laminated visuals of what to expect with them. Another important strategy is purpose. One of the kids I support arrives early to plug in the iPads in the classroom, and this incorporates his interest in technology and gives him a purpose for getting to school on time. Consider the child's individual triggers that might be associated with the transition and plan for these. These could be sensory, emotional, environmental, relational, or social. A sensory trigger could be increased noise level at the time of the transition. A relational trigger could be the teacher leaving the room briefly. Emotions such as rejection, injustice, or loss of control might be the cause of distress in a transition. Keep in mind that triggers aren't always obvious. If you're at a loss as to what set a child off, look at the whole situation and consider what happened. Often things that seem insignificant are actually triggers. Again, consider whether you are within your window of tolerance before supporting the child. What can you do to come back into your window by building in a pause? As, ad as adults, we have a greater ability to self-regulate by exhaling or using our thoughts to calm down first. Use a graded approach. If you have time, then slowly introduce new or unfamiliar people, tasks, or environments. Can you lengthen the time the transition takes? Can you reduce the number of changes or the number of triggers that are associated with the transition? And the final consideration is complete the stress cycle. 
A stressor, such as a transition, sets the wheels in motion. Even if we resolve it or take away the stressor, the stress train is already rolling and our bodies will hold this stress until it is released. We need to take time to support the child and often ourselves to complete the stress cycle after transitions and knowing what helps the child really helps here. So examples could be moving or stretching the body, running a lap of the oval or blowing bubbles to encourage those longer exhalations. Thanks, everyone. I'll, not, I'll now hand over to Brad, who is going to share his experiences with you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you. As the principal at Delegate Public School, we had to, we were sort of on the ground and the kids were, um, kids and their families were very much impacted by what was happening around us. So we needed to, uh, it was really important for us that we recognise what was happening to our community during this disaster period. We needed to listen to stories, to allow others to share their stories. And in times of deep need, like these fires brought us, we needed to pair things right back so we can best understand the needs of the community on all levels, not just on an educational level. In our school context, it was vitally important to understand that transitions are much more than just a child transitioning to school or back to school after a disaster. Transitions in our context spread much wider, in fact. It also included parents having to cope with separation of the child transitioning back to school. It was also managing and supporting staff who were experiencing the same traumas as the students and families because they lived in the same area and families transitioning back to their workplace. It also included things like family breakdowns, parents losing employment after as a result of the disaster and financial issues. So for us, we needed to really uh, understand what was experienced by the school from January 3rd, which was when the fires really became intense here through to 2020 and through to this day, in fact, because we're going through the transitions now. There has been no blueprint for our success. A large part of our body of work has, has been reactive as in, as a, in its nature. When in fact, schools operate on a model of being proactive and planning for lessons and events, et cetera. That hasn't been the case during the last 18 months. So I, as the educational leader in my community, needed to be present both physically and emotionally. And this provided great stability and availability to my community. We needed as an institution uh, to recognise and in a sense, normalise what was happening or has happened in our community. It was vital that during these times of transition that we as a collective, young and old, shared the stories of what everyone was going through and how events have affected and shaped us all. It's fundamental that during the times of transition, children, young people and their families feel that they are safe in their educational settings. And it's great that uh, the research that both Catherine and Billy talked about backs that up. Uh, the relationships, both Catherine and Billy talked about relationships and I just can't reiterate this point enough. I can't use the word relationships enough. It is what the human race thrives on, relationships both negative and positive and that keep the world revolving. In a small community such as ours in normal times, relationships are always at the forefront of the community thinking. The neighbour watching out for a stranger, strange things happening in the street, the friend picking up kids from the school because mum and dad are stuck somewhere else in a different town doing shopping, and the kids in kindy playing happily with kids in year six and vice versa. Brothers and sisters playing happily together in the playground because they are just another kid in our context. Or even me being Brad at the pub because there is no other pub to go to. And Mr Bannister in the school ground. Well, in times of disaster and uncertainty, these relationships were magnified intensely. And in fact, feuds, family feuds that were put aside for the time being just for the common good. Humans were strange like that. This is a picture of my library before uh, the fires. We needed as an institution to recognise and in a sense normalise what was happening, as I said before. And it was vital that during those times um, that we as a collective young and old shared the stories of how events were shaping. We needed to create an environment where a child wants to walk in the gate where it's so vital, was so vital for us. None of us would willingly walk into a cage full of roaring lions. Why then would we expect children as young as five to walk confidently in an environment that is not only doesn't promote and project safety, but one that is also doesn't exhibit it as one of its daily functions. Families expect this, children expect this, and society expects this. For me, teaching is the easiest part of any school I've ever taught in. The hardest part is actually getting the kids through the gate. Once in the gate, I say, we've got them. Nothing in the day-to-day -day running of operations of a school should be a secret, unless it's of a personal nature, of course. And to me, the following is needed to create, promote, and promote safety. Transparency, communication, 
honesty, and fairness. And I'd like everyone to remember this photo that we're just having a look at now. Communication makes transitions easier for all participants. It is vital that all communication channels are open and that they are open and operate both ways, both from us and for us. Schools need to give it and make it as make families comfortable to communicate with us. It needs to be clear and concise. Don't confuse an already stressful situation with unclear or shifting advice. If we don't know something, we need to communicate that too. And that includes just saying we don't know, and as soon as we know, we'll let you know. Not knowing is much better communicated than sending out the wrong information. It needs to be timely. As soon as we know, or I know, you will know. But it needs to be positive. That is something that we are so bad at as schools generally. We ring home when a student misbehaves. We grab mum at the school gate and say, little Mary has been naughty today. But in a sense, we need to encourage staff, and I encourage my staff, that for what, every one negative piece of communication you have with the parent, you also need to provide two positive ones. For us, one of the things that helped us in that area, we introduced and ramped up our school Facebook page filling it each day with, or even much more often of the great things that were happening at our school. And this was not to just necessarily paint us in a great light. It was also to give parents greater peace of mind that they could watch their children at school and understand that they were going, that they were actually happy rather than being stressed out by what was going on at school. And communication needs to be consistent. So consistency was a key. Communication at home always looks the same, should be on the same letterhead, should be in the same format. Communication home for events and requests is done with a vision to allow parents and families ample time to prepare the kids for whatever we were doing or whatever was going on in the school. Return of routine is an interesting one for us. So there is a very fine line between returning to regular routine in transition and being overwhelming for those transitioning. For us, safety, calmness and the opportunity were things that needed to be that needed to provide for a return to the routine. We recognise that for the previous four months of intense bushfire activity that had occurred in our area, that the return to, to routine was in the first instance simply just coming through the school gate and being here. And whilst educational outcomes and regular lessons were still important and relevant, they weren't the most important thing for us. So if a child needed to sleep, we let him sleep. If a child needed to share a story with an individual, be it an adult or another child, then provision and time was made for this to occur. If a child was hungry, we had food available to the help in this area too. So in, a, in essence, the routine of being at school between 8.30 and 3 gave the kids respite from what was happening in their real world. Remembering that photo that I had before on the slides there, this is the changed library. So we needed to provide colour and light to these kids' lives. What could we do to shed some light on a grim situation in these kids' lives? Remembering that the fires started for us on the 15th of November of 2019 and went through to the 15th of March. And for some kids, um, a number of our firefighting dads, they worked for 96 or 97 days consecutively on the fire front and missed Christmas and New Year and Australia Day and birthdays and things like that in their family. And during this time, the kids' world was just dark and gloomy. And when I say dark, I mean very dark. I personally, during this period, didn't have the skill set to hit the ground and fight the fires like the rest of this, some of the, the other people in our community. So I used my skill set that I did have to create a more positive learning environment for all using, just using colour. Over the course of four months, the kids and their families not only had been confronted with the gloom of fire, smoke and ash, but they also hadn't had the capacity to go anywhere. So in my mind, I needed to create a new, colourful and vibrant space that gave students some brightness. I painted the library in bright colours, as you can see, changed the furniture in the library space and revamped the classrooms as well. And it looks fantastic. And we've got some really great feedback around that. We arranged both whole family, including parents, and whole school excursions to give families just time together in a more relaxed and social setting. And that's it for me, and I'd like to pass over to Ben. So thank you, Ben. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, and thank you to Billy and Catherine as well. Uh, such interesting and insightful presentations. And thankfully now we've got about 25 minutes of questions, you know, questions from the audience. So if you have any, please filter them through to us. Um, and I guess while I have you here, Brad, you know, I've just, as I've been listening to your presentation, been thinking about kind of the layering of stress for, for you as an educator and your team. And, you know, I guess um, 
you know, any advice or guidance that you have for educators as they move into this upcoming period? You know, we've got lots of different kind of stresses in communities with floods and this new variant and lots of different things happening. So, you know, what kind of guidance do you have um, for educators and education leaders in supporting their own well-being? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Ben. Uh, so for me, um, I think I got to around about, oh, uh, let me see, middle of the year, and I thought I was going great. I thought I was, everything was fantastic. Brad's just, just to handle it really well. And I had a visit from my director and also Cathy Powson, who was in the New South Wales Department of Education. She was the Bushfire Edu Executive Director of Bushfire Recovery. And she came and both those people asked me the question, how are you going? And I was like, hmm. I'm fine. What do you mean? How am I going? And I think at that time, I was just running on adrenaline. And um, I went home that night and I thought to myself, oh, geez, has someone said something? Has someone said that I'm not going well? Or, But it actually made me reflect that indeed I wasn't very well. Um, I'd, I'd sat in front of a computer for the last um, six to eight months. Um, we went straight from bushfires into floods, into COVID. And because we're so close to the border, then the border closed, which meant some of our kids couldn't come to school and all those things. And I just sat in front of a computer just operating and I put on weight. Um, I was getting lots of headaches. I was not sleeping well. And I really had a hard look at myself in the mirror. And I, and I took time to say, right, I need to make time for myself for an hour a day. And that was just half an hour of exercise and half an hour of just me time, whether it was be with the dogs or with my wife. And, and I think that that helped me. And, and over the course of the next three months, not even three months, I lost 15 kilos. And that was a great thing for me. Um, and I started stop losing, stop having headaches, and I started not having chest pains and all that type of thing. And I think that that just that one person that said to me, "Are you okay?" made me stop and reflect and think about how I could better manage my own health. So for those educators out there that and our departments aren't very good, they're getting us, they're being reactive in the information that they're giving us around COVID and all that type of thing. My best advice is stop, take a breath. And take time for yourself because we're not very good at doing that. Yeah, thanks, Brad. It sounds like, you know, really looking out for your peers as well and those around you yeah. is a key factor in that as well. And yeah. And care um, up. I will say, Ben, we need to care up. I don't think that we care up enough um, as, as people in executive positions. We're very good at um, asking people that work for us or work um, in a, a line management situation below us we're very good at asking them if we're if they're okay we need to be better as a society of caring up so asking my boss if he's okay and asking the bosses above us are they okay because as it gets to the point you're in everyone's under a great deal more much more of stress so i think that caring up is just as important as caring down i really want to circle back to you as well with some of the questions that are coming through from the audience um, but to you next, Catherine, um, one of the questions that has come through is around how we involve children and young people in transitions. Um, and I guess just broadly speaking, as they move into, you know, this upcoming period, um, what are your thoughts and reflections around that? Yeah, it's a great question, Ben. And um, look, there was one example I gave him a little presentation there that even very young children, so infants and toddlers can still actively contribute to transition. So the example that I gave was around a, um, providing that opportunity for a young child to choose something from home to take to the education setting. And then they've got, you know, they've got that agency and power over making that choice. And they're actually, I realise more now than when I was an educator, that that's their attempt to connect the settings of home and school or home and early learning services. So that's a, even that's just, you can be intentional about providing that opportunity. If you're an educator, you can encourage family. Look, it's totally okay to bring a toy or a comfort object from home and we'll support that. Um, or for a family, just to know that, that that's okay and actually something positively positive that you can do. For older children or, you know, even very young children as well, like um, being ready to listen when they do share, it might be about their emotions, how they're how they're feeling about an upcoming transition but it might it might involve us to intentionally ask you know how are you feeling about starting school how are you feeling about returning to school after being away from for a long time um, and opening that opportunity that it's safe you know that that's on the table for conversation 
And then we have opportunity as an educator or as a family member for a child to share with us how they are feeling. So that's another practical way, being ready, ready to listen and respond if children do share. And sometimes that can come at moments we don't really expect, but also we might do some planning around, okay, let's have a conversation around how children are feeling about their transition. So just being ready and open for the conversations. As an educator, there's other things that you can do around, okay, we want to have a conversation, but I'm not sure how to bring this up. Let's, you know, read a book about starting school or read a book about moving house or becoming a sibling and having the conversation that way. Um, and if you have those books available in your learning environment when children choose them, that could also be an opportunity as well. So that there's lots of ways that children can be actively involved. Um, and some of those, if there is, um, maybe it's not about um, whether we do something, but a choice in how to do it. So that could be as simple as how, how we're getting to school. Would you like to walk all the way? Or um, can we drive part of the way and, and get the scooter out of the car and, and do that for the second half? So even if children are feeling a little bit anxious um, about returning to school, starting school or an early learning service, um, providing some choices as to how we might get there, what you might take um, are really practical ways as well. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, that sense of agency we can give to, to children. And Billy, you mentioned some great practical approaches that kids can do. Um, I'm sure a lot of the educators are curious about some of the things that you mentioned. You talked about the two by 10 approach. Um, what's that like for a child to engage in? Talk us through that in a little bit more detail. Yeah, sure. Um, so the two by 10 strategy is all about building a stronger relationship with the child and the adults around them. Um, so, you know, building trust and respect and it allows the adult to then support the child through co-regulation in those times of stress, like transitions. Um, so, yeah, you know, the stronger your relationship is with the child, the the easier and more quickly you're going to be able to use those cues to be able to help them to calm when they are stressed during the transition. Um, and what it could look like, you could build that two minutes into the day, um, you know, at recess, at lunch, in the morning, um, during class time if it's appropriate. And it's a really small amount of time and you might just approach the child and just ask them some questions about what they're interested in and start a conversation, just really listen what they want to do or you might even just comment on something that they're doing show interest in it really showing interest in them and allowing them to feel valued by you and listen to um yeah yeah it sounds like a and you know as brad alluded to the busyness of the classroom or learning context this tool or strategy is something you can do for two minutes um through the day um, so we will, for the audience, we'll be sending some information as part of um, resources. So we'll get Billy to add some more info around that. Um, Brad, thinking about unexpected transitions is a key one. I know for educators, there's the stuff we can plan. What was it like for you planning the unexpected stuff? Or how did you approach the unexpected stuff? Well, that was interesting because, uh, because we're such a small remote community, a lot of the, our tentacles go far and wide. So a lot of people knew a lot of other people in other areas. So a news report or behind the news or just a discussion can trigger things in kids that at, at strange times throughout the day or, or our, um, not only our families, but also my staff. So just having people available and having the time and, and knowing that the kids... I have an interesting story. So one of the little boys, um, I, we got loads and loads of extra counselling, which is great in a school because we don't have great a number of counselling as it is, but we've got lots of extra counselling in. And I said to the class, anyone need any extra support through this today? And one of the boys said, yep, 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 I'll go for that. And then uh, later on the day, I was just having a chat to him. I said, did you talk to um, the counsellor today, mate? And he goes, no, no, no. And I said, do you want to? And he said, no, no, it's okay now because I just needed to know that he was there. So, so just having us there whether it be me, whether it be the classroom teacher, that consistency of people. And for us as a very small school, we only get a really small general allocation of school counsellors. And I mean small, that is only two days per term. But because of the bushfire recovery, we, we had someone there pretty much two or three days per week for a good couple of terms. And that was great for the kids. Just knowing that Mr B is going to be there, the classroom teacher is going to be there, the counsellor is going to be here. And it, it allowed us to better deal with those things that they popped up in front of us. So there's extra triggers 
And they were just, as I said, they were random. It might have been just a kid talking about something else. It might have been the sight of smoke in the distance. It might have been a, a parched um, ember that they found on the ground that from there from months ago or a parched yeah. gum leaf. Those triggers... Uh, we couldn't have pre predicted those and we couldn't have um, prepared for them, but just having us all there was avail and the availability of the kids helped them massively. Yeah, I'm thinking about what Billy said there around co-regulation and the importance of, you know, how an educator is holding their space, even their facial expressions and tone of voice and how you met that boy, you know, Brad, in that moment of, hey, you know, that's absolutely fine and that relationship side of things, Billy, is is really important. You know, any practical ideas that you have for the educators on managing these ex unexpected transitions, similar to what Brad's saying, but any other practical ideas? Yeah, that's a really good question. And obviously we can't prepare for everything that happens. Um, and it's good to be able to support kids through that, you know, those unexpected times. So I think the first step would just be acknowledging the child's feelings and around that and reducing expectations around the transition. Um, and the next step would just be thinking about that co-regulation and thinking how can I help this child feel safe and supported through this uncertainty? And again, you know, tapping into that tone of voice, facial expression, body language. So thinking about the way that you're approaching them. Um, you might want to empathize through words that you understand what they're going through. So you might say, see, this is really hard and you're feeling upset. And it's amazing, I find in my work, how often just saying that to a child when they're upset, that often they, they don't want to respond. They might be so upset that they can't use their words, but you can see that they take that on and it helps them so much. Just you're putting out that hand and just saying, I can see what you're feeling and I, and I see that and I'm here for you. Um, you know, when they're a bit calmer, you might want to offer some options to move on together so giving those choices around what's going to come next even if it is within something that needs to be done um, allows that sense of agency so they're able to make a decision within the within the transition and within the uncertainty um, and again I'd be trying to use visuals if possible because like I said it's um, often hard for for the child to process what we're saying verbally um, and take that information in, but they're able, the visual system is often online and you can use drawing, even just, you know, demonstrating with using what you've got or showing objects or whatever it is that will help to communicate that message. Um, and another thing I think is really helpful is just having a little debrief afterwards um, with the child. And when you're both back into your window and you're both calm again, and it's just that opportunity for repair and to learn, like, from the transition together um, and even, you know, problem solve for next time. And I just wanted to say, add Ben as well, from an early childhood educator's perspective, what children might need when there's an unexpected change as well. So that can be something as simple as, you know, all of a sudden you might need to move to a different space and that wasn't expected and anticipated by everyone. And for children that you know that transition, this type of transition and change might be difficult, it could be as simple as, would you like to hold my hand as we walk to that next space? Or would you be able to carry this for me? We've got to take, you know, so they've got a bit of a role going back to, to Billy's um, example with the plugging in the, the iPad. So um, just recognise it could actually be, it could even be as simple as eye contact, the acknowledgement that oh, I wasn't in, I wasn't expecting this either. I just need to take a bit of a breath for a moment before we move to that other room. And just being, so educators are such powerful role models for how we, we might regulate and manage our own emotions and feelings when there is an unexpected change that we weren't expecting either. So it can be really, really simple and subtle, but really effective and being aware of which children may experience additional difficulties as part of it as well and anticipating that and having some things up your sleeve like uh, what Brad and Billy have suggested there as things that you can use at those times. And, and that brings up an interesting point for me, Catherine, is that one of the things that are most common, one of the most common feedback from a year six kid transitioning to a high school situation is their most, their biggest fear is just that it's a much bigger place and there's more rooms that they have mm. to find. So they're, they're in that transition space, they're just scared of not being able to be in the right room at the right time. So in a smaller primary school, that's a really easy thing to manage because we can do what you said, Catherine, and grab them by the hand and walk them around and, and show them. But in a high school situation, there's just many more rooms that they need to get and they need to get them there mm. themselves. 
there's they're not we're not lining them up for them like we would do in primary school settings so it's it, you're so right there Catherine you're so right 100 percent sometimes it can just be even even with that example um uh, and I'm just thinking in the current context where it's quite difficult for children, young people to visit maybe the next um, education setting, you can do all sorts of things with maps as well. Let, let's download a map yes. of the school and have a little around. Or the other thing is to remind children and young people when they have navigated that. Remember when we had to go over into the city and we really didn't know where we were going and we were feeling a bit anxious about it, but what did we do? So reminding them of other times where they have successfully navigated, finding, finding different rooms in an unfamiliar place might, might just go a little way to reach, oh, yes, I have done it before. You know, I am feeling anxious, but I, I do know that I can do this. Yeah, I want to I want to take us forward to the start of next year as um, children and young people are transitioning into the new year. And uh, Catherine, you referenced that you know just based on the experiences that a lot of learning communities and families have uh, faced, and the cumulative stress of the other impacts that there will be a level of anxiety and stress that's probably natural for the context that we're living in. You know, one of the things is, um, you know, how, how can educators meet this and what kind of words can they share with children during these times? Yeah, absolutely. It is really handy to have on hand um, things that you know that you can say to reassure children and young people. So if you do open up a conversation about how, how are you feeling about an upcoming transition and a child does say, look, I'm worried or I'm nervous or I'm not sure, I, I don't want to, um, the most important step that I've learned, mostly from being a BU consultant, is to acknowledge those feelings and that 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 they're okay, and that lots of people feel that as well. And it could even be going that next step to say I'm unsure and a bit nervous as well. Um, so always acknowledging and just giving a little bit of space. You don't need to immediately go on to, but actually, there's lots of things to look forward to. It's like okay, let's just sit with that for a moment, um, and you know, and that's okay and understandable because there's lots of things that we don't know. I guess the next step would be around, okay, um, so we're feeling this way. Maybe it's about something we're unsure about. You know, who could we ask? Who would? Who could we ask? It could be something around, um, I really want to know if I can take my soccer ball to school um, next year. Um, are we allowed to do that? It's like, okay, well, how about, you know, we go to the school or we contact um, the principal or assistant principal and find out, is it okay to bring your own soccer ball or will there be um, equipment available? So modelling that, the next step is around what, what can we do positively? It could be around seeking help, so asking someone. It could be around, okay, we just need to keep having conversations about this as the transition comes. Um, and it could be even around things like identifying where in the body that feeling is, if it's a nervous feeling, is it in your tummy? And just really recognising that that's okay. We don't necessarily need to solve or make that feeling go away, but they're, you know, role modelling around things we can do, feeling safe around emotions um, and, you know, that that's okay and other people feel that as well. So having you know, when we increase our own emotional literacy and are aware of our own feelings, we can assist children and young people to identify them, name them, describe them, have them out there. Um, and even just the sharing of them can be really beneficial um, without necessarily having um, solutions. But yeah, mo modelling what we can do when we're feeling that way as well. Um, I do recommend, you know, um, talking positively about transitions, but also not um, completely dismissing the other feelings that you know mm. yes there's things we're looking forward to but there's also things we're not sure about and that's okay to have mixed feelings yeah and thinking about the window of tolerance stuff that Billy mentioned as well and about the importance of being in your own window and as that first step and you know if we think about that context Brad moving into next year do you have any guidance or recommendation for educators or leaders who are listening in today to, to help them navigate um, that transition? Yep, there is no rush. There is no rush. So for me, um, one thing that the pandemic has taught us over the last two years, so remembering that a child that started kindergarten at the beginning of 2020 um, in our school setting has nearly, up to now, has nearly missed the whole year of school. Mm -hmm. There is no rush. The kids aren't anywhere near as far behind as uh, the media or um, some people would have us believe their well-being is the most important thing. So the reason we went into lockdown is to keep everyone safe. So it's okay and we can all catch up in the end. Um, and one of the things that 
one of the, another example so eloquently for our school is that a little boy started at the beginning of 2020. Um, he was our a, a behavior concern. He spent a lot, a lot of time in my office that um, sitting with me um, after being quite disruptive in his classroom. But now, um, if you had a, if you see him today, he is such a good little fellow. He's uh, he works really hard in class. He's way ahead of where he's supposed to be grade level. And when he started, he was probably behind where he was supposed to be in grade level. So there is no rush. Let's not rush them in that transition. Let's listen to their stories, as both Catherine and Billy have said. Let's take the time to connect and build that relationship. And that's something that we always do well as schools, but the pandemic's taught us that, that it's no rush. We just don't need to rush, mate. We just need to just, whoa, just whoa, it's okay. And we can help them get settled into where they've got to get settled into. Because we all know as adults, if we started a new job and everyone expected you to know everything straight away, uh, that's an impossibility. So let's just take the time and be here to support them. And they'll catch up. They'll catch up. I always say to any um, any intern that I've had in my class or any practice teacher that I've had in my class, and, and I don't know if this is actually the right thing to say now that I think about it, but I say to them, there is nothing that you can do in the next two to 10 weeks, whatever, that I can't fix when you're gone. So if, if, you, if something gets messed up, we can fix it. It's, there's no drama around that stuff. So if something gets messed up in the transition coming back to school next year because of COVID or fires again or whatever, or floods, we can fix it. You know, we can fix it. So let's just take our time and help them get the, the right transition. And the right transition is well-being first. Me for well-being first all the time. Thank you, Brad. I feel like that's a nice place for us to, to finish today. And naturally, there's lots of other questions from the, the audience that we'll be able to get to with the resource pack to follow. And one of the key things that's really sitting there for me is the importance of relationships. Um, you talked a lot about that, Brad and, and Billy and Catherine, and taking that time to connect, you know, thinking about next year and the, the two by 10 strategy that Billy mentioned or creating space. Brad, what's sticking in my mind is what you talked about, importance of well-being, you know, looking after yourself and, you know, getting into your own window as an educator and being aware of that through the day and how it naturally will move in and out just based on the stresses um, that we experience. So, yeah, I just wanted to say a big, big virtual thank you to, to each of you today. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of uh, really unpacked a lot of different things uh, throughout the presentation and really appreciate that. Um, you know, all the, to all the participants that are listening in from learning communities across the country, we wanted to thank you for your time as well. Um, we could see a lot of the participants stayed the whole way through today. And I hope you've taken some of the key learnings and knowledge from our speakers. Uh, but do keep an eye on your email um, as we'll, we'll send through the recording and some resources and different notes and things that will help you um, in this time of transition. And finally, remember that the next webinar that we'll have is in March, and we'll also send a, a reminder out for that one as well. So on behalf of BU, I um, wanted to send a big thank you to everyone, and we'll see you again soon.